Out of gas. Welcome back motorized bike enthusiast. In today's video our main focus is going to be on some of the unforeseen benefits of going smaller on the rear sprocket. We all know there's more speed but there's actually a lot of benefits I noticed immediately both while installing and the first couple of trips taken on a smaller sprocket. Then we're going to move on over to the YD100 to talk about some of the updates on its performance enhancement mods, some things that have worked, and some things that haven't. We'll be moving on over to the comments section to reply to some viewer comments, as well as giving a couple of shout outs to some YouTube channels I've been keeping an eye on lately for motorized bike content. I'm also going to give a couple of shout outs to some of the guys over on Facebook who've given me helpful information and showcased some of their builds. In the background of this video, you guys are going to be seeing a 40 mile round trip taken on the YD100 after we did the port mats modification, but before we went smaller on the sprocket. So the same performance as the last video on the stock rear sprocket. Now in this section of the video I'm not here to help you choose what size of sprocket to go with as that is based on personal preference, riding habits, the style of bike, the terrain, and your weight. But if you're willing to give up some sacrifices in the low end pedaling department, going smaller on the rear sprocket has a number of benefits which might appeal to a lot of people. Now something important that I want you guys to keep in mind is that the benefits we're going to be discussing about going smaller on the rear sprocket intertwine into two categories of riders. And this is an important distinction to keep in mind because it's going to affect your purchasing decision and how you might decide to ride the bike. The first category would be the economy user, somebody who is simply considering a smaller sprocket for a reliable means of transportation. They're not too interested in peak performance unless it makes their life easier. They want to stay legal and they want to have as little stress on themselves and the bike as possible while still being practical. The second category would be the performance rider, somebody who's simply interested in getting the absolute most they can out of their build and that's pretty self-explanatory. So keep those two things in mind as we talk about these benefits. Now for our economy guys, some things I want you to consider before deciding to go with a smaller sprocket. First, do you have to deal with a lot of stop and go traffic? Do you have to deal with hills? Are you a heavy set individual? Are you out of shape? Is it a single speed cruiser that you're on? Is it a stock China doll motor with no modifications? If you answered yes to a lot of those, or even just a couple of those, you might want to consider sticking with the stock sprocket, and in some cases going with a larger one. When you have to deal with a lot of stop and go traffic, it's not fun to pedal those single speeds all the time, and if you're smaller on the rear sprocket, you're going to be really doing a lot more pedaling, especially with a stock motor. In my situation, I can justify going with a smaller rear sprocket for a number of reasons, but two of the big benefits are, first off, my bike has gears I can choose, so I like to start in a nice low gear for easy pedaling. Plus, I'm using a YD100 that I started to modify. This means that the motor is going to rev to its maximum RPMs a lot quicker, and it can justify losing some low-end torque on a smaller sprocket simply because it kind of balances itself out. So balance is the key word here. Just keep that in mind. Now obviously the guys going for performance are going to want to go smaller on a rear sprocket in most situations as I assume a lot of them are track style flat ground maximum speed. And this is where it starts to become a benefit as we mentioned. As you start to modify your motor you reach your maximum RPMs quickly. If you rev out very quickly like we did on the YD100 after we port matched the case then you're going to need to go smaller on the rear sprocket because any further modifications you do to make the motor more powerful, you're not really going to see the benefit of those as, yeah, your motor would just reach its top speed a little faster, but you're not really going to go much faster. There's also a tuning aspect. Where does your motor provide the most amount of power that you want to utilize? 
could depend on the carb you're using, if you have a pipe, and where you like the motor to just cruise at. In that case, you would want to try a couple of different sprockets to find out what you and the bike like the most. Now moving back over to our economy guys, there's a legality issue that you have to keep in mind. But you can kind of overshadow that with your own riding style. Smaller sprocket means the bike is capable of a higher top speed, but that does not necessarily mean you have to go at the top speed. Despite what you'll see in a lot of comments, it is, in my opinion, not a good idea to run these motors at wide open throttle for extended periods of time. Now, keep in mind, I am not talking about the performance guys. If you're trying to just go fast and get the most out of your bike while it has a short lifespan, that's fine. But for the economy guys, I tell you this for a number of reasons, which you'll see throughout this video, is wide open throttle is never where you want to be. First off, if you're cruising around at a lower throttle position, your bike is quieter. If you have a smaller sprocket, you're going to go faster while being quieter. You're also going to cool the motor better because you're going faster at a lower RPM. Vibration, especially on the cheaper motors, which don't have balanced cranks. Vibration's a big deal. It starts shaking the bike apart. You lose bits and pieces, nuts and bolts here or there. Despite Loctite and stuff, things will still fall off your bike at wide open throttle. It's inevitable. However, lower cruising speed, less vibrations. You can get just the right sprocket size, as we mentioned with tuning, to get your bike to cruise at the speed you want it to at a comfortable RPMs where it's not super noisy, it's not shaking itself apart, and it just feels nice and smooth. You can keep that in a legal speed limit so the bike and you run happier. Fatigue on the body as well. Vibration starts to take a toll on your arms and your ass after a certain amount of time. Now you can negate some of this with how you build your bike, but a really easy and simple way to deal with it is just to run the motor at a lower RPM. Ease of installation. Installing a small sprocket was quite a bit easier than a large one because there's less disc area so you don't have to maneuver your hand around a big sprocket to get all the little nuts and bolts installed. This is a big benefit to somebody like me who likes to use a rag joint and it's a small benefit to somebody who uses a clamp on. As many of us know, truing a rear sprocket can be quite tedious and in some cases an absolute nightmare, whereas on other builds it can be relatively simple. Well, truing a smaller rear sprocket is quite forgiving, as it doesn't amplify the negative effects as severely as it does on a larger sprocket. This is for both lateral and perpendicular movement. One can cause the chain to tighten and loosen as you go faster, and the other can cause it to wiggle back and forth, which in severe cases could cause the chain to jump off the sprocket. The smaller disc area of the smaller sprocket simply is, well, as I said, more forgiving in this situation, meaning that you don't have to be spot on, so for those builds which really give you a hard time getting a perfectly true rear sprocket, you can rest easy with the smaller size. Fuel economy. Kind of a no-brainer, so we're not going to spend much time on it, but if your motor has enough power output to complement the smaller sprocket you've chosen, then you're going to get more fuel economy. Not a big deal, as these bikes are already pretty efficient even on their worst day. It's good to keep in mind to know you can go quite a, quite a bit further on one tank. Now, if you have a stock motor that does not support the sprocket you chose and you're bogging it down the whole trip, your fuel economy might actually go down. So keep that in mind. Now, last but definitely not least is what I saved for this section of the video because all the points we discussed previously help complement what I'm about to talk about. Is your perception of speed and distance. In the background of this video, you've been seeing me go on a 40 mile round trip journey with the stock 442 sprocket. Don't get me wrong, it was a lot of fun, I love doing stuff like this, but when I got home, I was fatigued, tired, and just ready to relax. I didn't want to ride the bike anymore. Plus, I also ran out of gas right before I got to the house, but that's not really a big deal. However, when I put the 36.2 sprocket on this particular bike and retook this journey, not only did I complete it considerably faster, I had gas when I got home, but I just was a lot more comfortable because of the points we discussed previously in the video. Not only do you get where you're going faster, but you get there more comfortably. Trips that you might consider to be daunting seem a lot more practical with a smaller sprocket.
Now for a rundown update on the performance modifications we've attempted on the YD100 and so far nothing has justified a full video. So apologies for not doing any updates throughout the week like I wanted to, but really there wasn't anything for you to miss except for a bunch of stuff that didn't work. We did find one thing that did work, ironically enough it was just a temporary experiment, but we're at a current top speed of 42 miles an hour and I'll explain. First we tried the FlexFit Popo pipe, which we had on the trail bike. Gave us good low end and accelerated faster, but topped out at 38 miles an hour, so we lost 2 miles. We then tried the stock exhaust with the cap removed because everybody goes faster when their bike is louder, and lost a dismal 5 miles an hour, giving us a top speed of 35 miles an hour without the cap. Put the cap back on, drilled a quarter inch hole in the cap to hopefully open it up while maintaining some back pressure and only got a top speed of 39 miles an hour losing one mile which was in within margin of error but the bike just did not sound like it was running very smooth with the hole in the exhaust so we plugged it back up and got back to our 40 miles an hour we then tried as an experiment removing the air box from the carburetor and just keeping the little foamy bit zip tied to the end and got a top speed of 42 miles an hour so the air box is slightly restrictive opened it up a bit got some performance. Nothing great, but hey, two miles is two miles. Anyways, the main reason I took this air box off is because I don't like the stock box that comes with the YD100. It's a scoop design. The older designs suck in air from the bottom. This sucks in air from the front of the motor, which means all the dust getting flicked up from the front tire is sucked straight into the carburetor, and the air, <laughs> the air itself is heated from the heat of the motor. So, I don't like that. I'm going to try and rig up one of the old style stock air boxes and just open it up a lot more. I also need to get some fenders on this bike so I'm not flicking so much dust into the carburetor. But more on that in a future video. That's where we are at the moment guys, 42 miles an hour with the air box removed. Next up I'd like to give a shout out to a handful of YouTube channels which have been making some entertaining content lately and some honorable mentions to channels which might not be directly related to motorized bike stuff but I think you guys will still enjoy them for the most part. I might butcher some of these names but we're going to start with Brian David. Brian focuses mainly on ramping pistons and porting cylinders so if you have questions feel free to ask in one of his videos because he seems to be pretty active responding to some of my answers within a couple of days or my comments sorry. And unlike 95% of the Facebook and YouTube community he backs up what he says by showing his work and his experience, so when he says something, it's a pretty good bet that you can take it to heart. He's the, about the only person on YouTube which I can tolerate watching videos vertically from a cell phone. <laughs> Moving on to our Australian crowd, we got Nick Grimson, which is new to the hobby, but has been really active in cataloging pretty much all of his adventures on building his first couple of motorized bikes. He's been learning a lot, giving some relevant information along the way, and each video gets a little better on video editing, so I can really appreciate that. He's really active, so go check him out. We got James here. James is not really active on YouTube, but every video he puts out, when I see the information he provides so far, I can take it to the bank. His thoughts seem to line up closely with what I think on these bikes, so check out the few videos that he does have and encourage him to make more because, well, I think he has the potential to make some quality content. Southern Custom CCs, these guys aren't really active, but you can usually expect one or two videos a month from these guys. Now, they're mostly just basic information, but they really do a good job with their editing, especially when they did the YD100 versus SATA 80 video. He's very thorough on his testing, and there's a lot of information, especially for new guys who are trying to consider what motors, what kind of bikes, if you should go electric or gas, and just, uh, well, basic information. So go check them out. Um, we got, what is it, Hugus Motorized? <laughs> this guy's cool. He's got a really good demeanor and his attitude is great. He's got good information about two and four stroke motorized bikes um, and is pretty active on YouTube. His videos are pretty well edited as well. They're no flair, no thrills, but they're no nonsense. They get straight to the point. We got Austin Welsh. He's more of an all around ride bike kind of guy. I would say he's more of an entertainer just along for the ride. He does provide some information and reviews and stuff. Uh, I especially like his why I'm not fixing my motorized bike video. Um, this lines up with a lot of what I think on certain bikes. But go check him out. He's also got, uh, I think it's the Hawk 250, which is similar to my crappy Magician 250. is just the better version. But he's been pretty active as well in the motorized bike community. 
Next, we got Epic Bike Shop. These guys are another cell phone channel, but they're one of the few ones which you can enjoy. These guys are more of just a, a relaxed, post-random stuff, motorized bike channel. They do a lot of custom work, but they're not trying to sell anything in their videos. They're just having fun and showing off. They're pretty active, posting pretty much every week. Honorable Mentions goes to Let's Learn Something. This is not a motorized bike channel, but this guy is really amazing with what he is able to do. He'll take things like air compressors and turn them into motors. He'll take refrigerator compressors and turn them into motors. He took a four-stroke and turned it into a two-stroke. His videos are kind of long. They're not narrated, but they're very crisp, high quality, and just relaxing to watch. The sound is good, too. I really enjoy what he does on this channel. And last but not least, we got Playing With Fire. He's not really a motorized bike channel. He does have a handful of motorized bike videos, but he just does some random fun stuff and has a lot of real quick adventures. Plus, he's a gun guy like me, and I can appreciate that. Greystone Gardens would love to see somebody build one of these trail bikes with a high-quality mountain bike. He thinks he might do it himself. And to that, I have to say, heck yeah, man, go for it. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. But that's something we could definitely use seeing on YouTube. It's a nice, high-quality mountain bike with a motor on it. Personally, I'd love to see it myself. I just can't afford it. Matthew Steva has a question about using silicone spray as a chain lube. Uh, mostly, I think it's to help keep dirt and debris, mud off the chain. Honestly, in certain conditions, I don't think there's any way to keep mud off the chain, but I have a question for you guys. What's your favorite kind of chain lube? Personally, for the most part, I just use gear oil. Or if I happen to have a spray can of random chain oil, I'll put it on. But when it comes to these motorized bikes, if you're using a beefier chain, something like a 415 or better, as long as you have some lubrication on there, it's fine. From time to time I get people asking why I don't do the four-stroke builds and really it's just that I invest in myself in the two-strokes because I like how you can tinker on them, the modifications you can do to them, quote-unquote upgrades, availability price, and the available information when it comes to the two-strokes. There's a big community built around it and I'm just not all that interested in the four-stroke builds. Kristen found out he had a piston in backwards and it ripped the wall out and made a big old cut side of his cylinder. This is pretty common lately. I've been seeing a lot of videos, pictures, and just random posts about backward cylinders and bad wrist pin clips, guys. Two things that I recommend doing highly is make sure your piston is in properly, not backwards, and if possible, upgrade those wrist pin clips. In a couple of my motors, these clips are trash. XG Red Tile wants to know where I'm buying motors. Currently nowhere, because not a lot of people have them at the moment. But Amazon is usually where I get most of my stuff. Mr. Mad recommends going with a 21mm carburetor next on the YD100. And this is actually something I was going to put up in a poll to see what you guys would think. What carburetor do you think I should go with next on the YD100 for a non-read setup? If that makes a difference. Now I do eventually plan on putting a read on this build. But I want to start with some non-read setups to see how far we can take it. So, I would prefer personal experience carburetor suggestions. Uh, feel free to just recommend whatever you think might work. We'll put it in a poll, throw it up on the community page, and have everyone vote on what our next carburetor should be on the YD100. Also, we're going to need some jet recommendations. Uh, yeah, because I don't have any experience buying aftermarket carburetors for these motors. Frosty Flakes wants to know what would happen if you put two-stroke oil in the crankcase below the piston. I'm assuming he means in a two-stroke motor. Because if you're interested in what happens if you put two-stroke oil in a four-stroke, Project Farm already has a video on that. You can go check them out. But if you put oil in the crankcase of a two-stroke, a few drops, a little bit drizzled in the bottom, I don't think it's going to hurt anything. It's just going to get sucked up and blown out with the rest of the mix anyways. However, if you flood that crankcase with a lot of oil, I imagine that you're never going to get that that motor started unless you drain out that oil it might also blow some seals out it's hard to tell I don't know if it would damage anything but uh, it's certainly not gonna make things easy on you that'd be an interesting experience though just dump a bunch of oil in the crankcase of a two-stroke and see what happens how long it takes to get it started alright guys so I got a lot more comments to go through I'm trying to make time so I can reply to as many of these as possible. If you've left a comment over the past two weeks and I haven't gotten to it yet, I apologize, guys. I'm trying, but my schedule is all wacky right now. Anyways, 
Thanks for the love. I do appreciate it. And a few of the Facebook shout-outs to some of the guys who have been sending me a message on random bits of information and asking questions. Inevitably, they share some of their builds, and I get to see some interesting and creative ideas. So, here's a couple of pictures from Dean and what he's got going on. <laughs> Pretty creative tank there. And these are always good pictures to see. Even if your build is just simple and you don't think there's anything special about it, always checking out pictures like this can give you random ideas because everybody always thinks of something unique, even if it's a simple, basic build. Let's see what we got next. Somebody's got a little beefy performance setup here going on. I bet he's going to break 40 miles an hour, no problem. Yeah, eventually I might end up trying to go with a setup like this on the YD100. I still don't know much about reads, but I know that looks pretty nice. Big shout out to Billy. He's given me a lot of information based off his own personal experience. And he even watches <laughs> Brian as well. But uh, he's got some stuff going on here with a few of his builds. He's really been tearing them down and getting some pretty thorough investments, I would say. And Holden, I'm not ignoring you, buddy. I just haven't got to you yet. But he sent me an attachment for a silencer that you can use with some of these loud pipes. And I'm going to have to dig into this and find out how well they work together. But uh, if these can significantly reduce the noise from one of these, heck yeah. An MZ pipe might look uh, pretty promising in our future. Alright guys, keep an eye out for the community post over the next couple of days. We're going to be asking you guys what carburetor you think I should put on the YD100 next. I'm going to take your suggestions and then put them in a community poll for you guys to vote on. We're going to go with a non-read setup first, and then we're going to try it with a read to see how much of a difference everything makes. I can give you guys some solid numbers. I'm also still adding a second base gasket, which I'm doing tonight, and if I get a noticeable improvement in top speed, I'll be sure to post a video as soon as possible with a new top speed run. I'm hoping for the best. I'm also going to try ramping the piston as we mentioned before, but measuring the ports versus the piston is proving to be difficult on a one-piece jug, especially after watching Brian's videos on how to do it right. At least, at least I think. I think I know how to do it right. But for the one-piece jug, since I obviously can't remove the head, measuring the ports is probably going to require very careful positioning and spray paint. Uh, if you have any suggestions on how to measure the ports on a cylinder with a one-piece jug for ramping, feel free to post the suggestions in the comments. Videos would be fantastic. Stay safe, and I'll see you in the next video.